Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker tonight is Chuck Bargeron. Thank you so much. And I am I'm gonna talk to you about some invasive species issues um, that we deal with across the, um, the Southeast and ultimately some things that, that you can do about them. So the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health um, started um, actually in the mid nineties. Um, we started working on this and in 2008 became officially a center within the University of Georgia. Um, it is a partnership between the College of Ag and um, at College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences and the School of Forestry and Natural Resources. And, and we, we typically have co-directors, one from the forestry side and one from the ag side. And I'm, I'm currently the co-director from the um, forestry side. Um, our work is completely outreach and extension based, um, focused on invasive species, integrated pest management and forest health. And a lot of what we do is building information technology tools to provide information for scientists, professionals, and the public, and build partnerships. That's why, you know, I've been involved in some of these different organizations. Um, and this is a snapshot of our group. Um, we are located in Tifton, Georgia, on the Tifton campus of, of the University of Georgia. And so um, this, this was our group um, about a year ago, I think, now. Um, so dive into what we're here to talk about. Um, what is an invasive species? So by definition, an invasive species is something that is not native to the area where it is found and who's, and by it being there, is going to cause or likely cause economic, environmental, or harm to human health. So that, that is the definition. So you know, a lot of times things are referred to in different ways and, and there's noxious weeds that are brought up sometime. Um, but, but an invasive species under this definition, um, this, is, this is what the definition is. And so why do we care? Well, these species not only have that economic impact and the estimate is, is in the hundreds of, um, of billions of dollars per year and in, in the impact that it causes to the United States. Um, but they also threaten um, endangered species because of competition. And so when you do that breakout of 138 billion, you can see it's kind of split between insects, plants, mammals, and microbes, which would be diseases. And so I'm gonna kind of start off and talk about some of the more exciting things, some of the animals and, and insects, and then I'm gonna move into the plants, which I think is probably where y'all's interest is actually more at. So this is a comparison that, that I like to always make to kind of get the point across. We all know that chemical pollution is bad, but chemicals break apart, they, they degrade over time. When you start talking about many of these species, all they do is multiply over time. And so the argument can easily be made that where there's been a lot more tension in chemical pollution, maybe this biological pollution is even worse for the environment. Now, I wanna be clear, not all exotic species, not all non-native species, not all introduced species are bad. Um, so most of our food system is, is, is um, introduced species and, and introduced species, you know, our pets are not native to here. Um, you know, they're, we're using, they are used in landscaping, they're used um, in a lot of different areas. So I'm not saying just because something is not from here, it's bad. So let's dive into the animals. Well, first of all, something that, that most people know, and I didn't know until I've really dived, dove into this, is the wildlife trade, the illegal wildlife trade, is, a 10, is $10 billion a year in legal wildlife trade, and it's five to $20 billion a year in, Ill in illegal trade. And that is the largest um, illegal trade of, of things after drugs and arms. And we're talking about exotic snakes, exotic animals, you know, of all shapes and sizes that are, that are illegally brought into the United States. Um, and the US is one of the largest importers of these species, both legally and illegally. 
So a few years ago, this picture hit the internet and it was a Burmese python with a with a American alligator um, coming out of it. And nobody knows the whole story in terms of how it ended up in this predic predicament. But the bottom line is somehow the python got the alligator into it enough and maybe was tired and got attacked by another alligator or something. But a park service, a park service um, um, helicopter pilot found this and or saw that and, and took the picture and it really brought, brought light to the Python issue. Um, and, and why we care, and I'm going to go through this with, with some of the, the pictures and, and, you know, scary things about these pythons. First of all, they get really big. Um, here's one that was captured in 2009 that was 15 foot long. I should have included it in the presentation. I got an email today that the largest one yet, which was over 18 feet, was caught in the Everglades um, this week. Um, there's been some interest from the government. They reproduce rapidly. Um, this one was found with an adult deer in its belly. Um, they found them swimming in salt water outside of um, um, Florida Bay. And, and what the impact has really been is they decimated the mammal population in the Everglades. And we really don't know what the long-term impacts of that are going to be. So just some other pictures. This is a very interesting um, graph showing the, the impact. This is what it takes for a python to reach 13 feet which is approximately five to seven years. This is the amount of mass they have to eat to get to that point. And so here is where um, pythons have been found. Um, you know, you get the, we do get the occasional one that shows up in Georgia, this one, and, and there was one over near Albany that were both um, likely pet releases. There was no sign of, um, of a reproducing population. But down here, when you get to the Everglades, they're definitely reproducing populations. So that's the Python. And you're like, okay, well, that's pretty scary, Chuck. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to be traveling to South Florida anytime soon. You know, I'm, I'm not so sure about this. Well, I can deal personally with the Pythons. When it comes to these Nile monitors and tegus, which I'm going to talk about next, this is where I get concerned because this is a relative to the, um, uh, the Komodo dragon um, that they have in, in, in um, Asia, but it is a, it is, it is found, um, you know, there's populations throughout South Florida, it's very aggressive and it can grow to be six foot long. So yeah, I think I can deal with the, the python, having a dragon, small dragon, come chasing after me, I'm not so sure about. Um, the tegu is another species um, of, of these kind of large lizards. Um, they're not quite as aggressive as, um, as the, the Nile monitors are, but we have populations of these tegus in Tombs and Tattanoe County in Georgia. They found populations in South Carolina now, um, and, I, and I think there's, there's rumors of a population in North Carolina. So not only um, are they in South Florida, we also are starting to see them in other places. And if you've ever been to Tombs in Tattano County, it's pretty amazing that they found anything in those counties because they're pretty low population areas. Um, you know, keeping on the big scary stuff, um, the giant African snail um, is a popular, there's a population of those in South Florida. Um, not only are they a, um, do, do damage to everything, they can carry the rat lungworm which can cause meningitis in humans. And so as you can see by the picture, they're a very large um, uh, snail. They, they have been imported for aquariums and stuff like that, um, but, but they're very aggressive and, and um, there's been a lot of money and effort to, um, to remove them. So those are kind of the terrestrial an land animals. You move over to aquatic animals. Um, there's these zebra and quagga mussels those are not yet a problem in the Southeast, but they're causing huge dam amounts of damage in the West, both for surveillance and for, um, um, and, and for treatment. And it's amazing some of how far um, uh, 
personal boats travel, how, how, how far they have, they've tracked these boats that people carry. And, 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 and that's what happens. The, the muscles get on, um, get on a boat, get on the, um, the motor of a boat and it gets moved from one area to another um, by, in most cases, sm small fish, fish, you know, recreation type, um, type boaters. Asian carp, um, these are, are related to the grass carp that are used in, in ponds sometimes. Um, however, they can, you know, populations get, get big. These are the fish that you may have seen the videos of jumping out of the water. They can get very big um, and, and, and we are really, there's a, there's a huge effort that's been going on for a long time to keep them out of the Great Lakes. Um, linefish, this is one of the scariest stories, I think. Um, another fish, it was kind of an aquarium fish. It was first found in, in the 90s. They're seeing um, major damages to reefs and it is spread. I mean, these are where all the different places where they found these. And I mean, in an ocean situation, there's almost nothing that, that can be done for, about these. They are fairly tasty. I will say that. I think they're difficult to prepare, but I have eaten them before and they are pretty tasty. Um, wild pigs, um, usually not even thought about as an invasive species, but definitely are. Um, this was the big one that was found in South Georgia that, um, that National Geographic did a doc, Hogzilla National Geographic did a documentary on. Um, it's still kind of questionable how it got that big, but um, most of them are much smaller and, you know, they can cause major um, damage to um, ag fields and, as well as yards. And, um, and they have really expanded across the country um, fairly quickly. They're, they're now in over 36 states and, um, and just really blowing up. Um, and, it's, you know, and this was kind of a joke of, well, maybe we can use the alligators to take out the um, wild pigs. Um, talk about some of the insects and diseases. These are where you see decimation of species. Dutch elm disease pretty much wiped out the elm trees. Um, American chestnut was wiped out by the chestnut blight. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid is doing a pretty good number on hemlock trees along the um, um, Appalachian Mountains. And so there's a lot of campaigns to kind of prevent this, you know, and, and, and if you've been to any state parks, you know, they encourage you now to buy the firewood at the state park, not bring it in because bringing in that wood material can spread some of these insects and, and cause bigger problems. Um, so MRS bore is one um, that, that is, is now pretty well established in Georgia. Um, it started in, in Michigan in 2002 and has really spread. It's a, it's a very charismatic, it's a little small insect um, that, that, you know, is, is focused on ash trees and um, will potentially wipe out um, the green ash species, which, you know, at, that's what's used to make baseball bats, um, the wood baseball bats. So it's a huge impact and, and the spread, the, the states that um, this is now spread to is, is, is just amazing in a very quick time. Um, this is Asian longhorn beetle. It is a, um, a very scary looking, um, um, couple inch long beetle that um, feeds on maples as well as some other trees. Um, it was recently found um, in South Carolina outside of Charleston. Um, and so it looks like the population has been there a while, um, but it seems to be contained in about an eight or nine mile um, area. But, and so Georgia Forestry Commission and others uh, have been on, on the lookout for this just to see, make sure it does not um, jump over in, into Georgia. A few others I'm just going to mention briefly. Thousand canker disease is a beetle that spreads a disease that has impacts on, um, um, on walnuts. And um, it is starting to, um, we're starting to see distribution. It was, it was it's been known to be in, in some of the Western states, but, but it's really gonna have more of an impact on the Eastern states. Um, ambrosia beetle, another small beetle that, that carries a fungus. Um, 
it was first found near Savannah um, and has rapidly um, grown since then. Um, the real, I'm sorry, um, the real concern about this, Red Bay is a is an understory tree that most people didn't know it was is widespread until they all started dying. Um, however, this is one of those situations where, okay, well, it's just killing red bays. We're not that worried about it. Well, it got down to um, to South Florida and it started having impacts on avocados, and so they're really concerned about what this is gonna ultimately do to the avocado industry in, in South Florida. And then if it was worth to get to Mexico, what the impacts would be there. So one of these, you know, not nobody could get that excited about it when it first showed up, but ended up um, could have a major impact. Um, kudzu bug, an unfortunately named um, species, um, but it, but it feeds on kudzu as well as um, wisteria. So, hey, that's a good thing. Well, it also feeds in, on soybeans. And um, these populations, it was found outside of Athens. Um, the populations exploded. Um, I, I remember standing in parking lots and, and seeing, seeing them flying around, landing on me. They looked like lady beetles, but they were um, ladybugs, but they were um, brown. And, and square, so they were pretty easy to recognize. Um, what um, they also could be nuisance, you know, to tear up your um, your your ankle when you got out there on them. They spread quickly, um, and then the population just crashed. And and there's a lot of different speculation on why. But um, this map is actually you know years since we've seen the the last report, and. Um, it, Crazy, crazy um, thing, but uh, something that could have been a huge problem to soybean fields that, that kind of crashed pretty quickly. This is the one we're worried about now, spotted lanternfly. It feeds on a lot of different species and um, tree of heaven, which is an invasive plant, is one of its um, major hosts that it needs. And so there's been a lot of efforts to, to really look at where tree of heaven is to, to help monitor for this. It's currently in Pennsylvania and some of the surrounding um, states, um, but you know it's, it's not very long before it could easily spread down to us. And because Tree of Heaven is pretty widespread across the country, um, and, and we think it needs Tree of Heaven to um, for its life cycle, then you know um, that's where we're looking. Um, there's. A couple of others, crepe myrtle bark scale, um, uh, tawny crazy ant. Um, these, you know, just kind of different from the fire ants. And 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 what's really a problem is, you know, all of that right there are, different, are ants. They just they they have these huge um, um, populations when they get going. Um, here's where where it's been found. So. I wanted to show you, uh, and I probably spent too much time showing you, but I wanted to show you the bad, scary stuff to maybe make you appreciate why, you know, we worry about some of the plants sometimes. So let's dive into the plants. You know, we all know kudzu. We all know, um, um, you know, the joke about how fast it grows. And, you know, here's the photographer that, that got, you know, taken over by the kudzu. Um, but, it, but but there's a lot of other plants, um, a lot of, you know, plants that are that are pretty um, showy that we recognize that, that we see all the time. Um, but I, I want to give you the scope of the problem. These invasive plants, they, they invade our ag fields, they invade our forest, they invade our natural areas, they invade our riparian areas along rivers, they invade our water bodies, our fishing holes, our roadsides, right of ways under power lines, um, old home sites. Um, some of them are grown for energy crops. Um, you know, others were planted for different reasons for windbreaks. This is that's actually bamboo. Um, some are near and dear to us because it's Chinese privet that is the hedges around um, 
around um, Sanford Stadium. And so some, some plant, you know, some of these invasive plants really have a place in, in our hearts. Um, but, but some others are, are invading our national forest and national parks. So you know, we talked about some of the definitions, whether it's native, exotic, or, or invasive. And, and we all know what weeds are. We all have weeds in our yard. We all deal with weeds. Um, some of those weeds are native. Some of them are, are non-native. Usually the ones that are more aggressive are the ones that are not native. Um, but the definition of a weed is a plant out of place where an invasive, you know, is this concept of a species that is causing this harm. Um, they got here different, a whole lot of different ways. Uh, Kogon grass, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, got here we think is a packing material. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that, that they got here. Some of them got here because we planted them. Um, kudzu was used for erosion control. Um, we've used other plants because they were good for attracting wildlife or we even planted them in our garden. There's this 10, tens rule and I think it's, it's a really interesting breakdown. Of the 1,000 plants that we may introduce, a hundred of them will escape. Of those a hundred, ten will um, will natural naturalize, and then one would actually be a problem. And so, what we try to do is, if we can minimize that, and we've got some pretty good means with risk assessments to minimize some of that, um, then you can really make an impact um, on what's on what's brought in. There's a concept of a lag phase where you know, at some point, then you see this exponential growth. Um, and if you look at Chinese privet uh, in the South, we've seen that in terms of its distribution, that, that at some point it just shot up in terms of where we knew where it was. And, and when you think about it, when you think about what ornamental plants, you know, what do you want? You want something that's easy to grow. You want something um, this showy, you want something that attracts birds, you want something that's pretty resistant to pest. So the same characteristics we look for in our ornamental plants are the ones that make it a better candidate to be an invasive plant. And the main thing is, you know, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Um, and, you know, we look at the world climate, why do we get a lot of these species from China and Japan? Because our climate is similar to China and Japan. So what do we know is causing a problem um, in Georgia specifically? So every few years, the Georgia Forestry Commission does a um, report of the species that are causing the most problem. They call it their dirty dozen, and it's really their dirty dozen plus one, and the one is Kogon grass. So these are the amount of estimated acres of forest and forest edges that these plants um, take up in, in Georgia. Um, and, and there's some interesting ones on here. Um, English ivy, something that, that, you know, probably a lot of people, you know, yeah, it can get out of hand in your yard and can climb up trees, but you don't really think about it being that big a forest invasive, invasive but, it, but it is. Um, wisteria kind of, kind of the same way, unless you've tried to get rid of a wisteria plant in your yard and you know how hard it is, then you don't necessarily think about it being that, that big a problem, except for occasionally on roadsides and stuff. So it's an interesting thing. The privets um, are, are, are the top one, stilt grass um, down, down from there. Kudzu is not our worst species. Um, and tallow tree and Japanese climbing fern are really the ones that are on the rise. Those are the ones that we're really starting to see a lot more of. Overall in the South, it's estimated that 18 million acres um, of forest land in, in, in the 13 southern states are accompanied by these 30, by 33 species. And that's about 9% of the forested acres. So I want to point out a couple of them. Um, tallow tree, um, it, you know, the leaf is what is really distinct on this. It usually grows in, in wetter spots. And, and I, I've seen some really bad thick thickets of it. Um, Japanese climbing fern, y'all probably have not seen a lot of um, in, in Cobb County yet, um, but, it, but it, 
it is starting to spread more and more in Georgia and South Georgia. We're seeing it more in South Georgia. And so I'm sure there's some populations that are starting to emerge. Um, there's two of these. There's one in South Florida called Old World Climbing Firm that we're not sure will go past about um, Gainesville, Florida, um, temperature wise, but, but Japanese climbing fern um, definitely will. Um, and it's, it's a major fire hazard because it, it just climbs up the trees. Um, and this is where I think y'all would see it introduced is from, um, from pine straw. It, um, it, it, you know, getting it, um, getting pine straw that's been contaminated with it. Um, and, and if you ever want to get kicked out of a, um, of a Lowe's, go in with a, a camera and start taking pictures. Um, we, um, me and one of my colleagues went, you know, stopped by Lowe's at lunch to get something. And we saw this packet of, of dirt from Florida and there was Japanese climbing fern growing um, out of the top of it. Luckily we were able, you know, because they, uh, um, because they confronted us and said, Hey, what are you doing? Oh, you know, they actually disposed of this, um, of this dirt and didn't let it, um, didn't let it get out. Um, and then the real bad actor, um, um, Kogan grass, um, it is very aggressive. It chokes out everything else in a forest system. Um, and you know, has these showy flowers. Um, huge amounts of rhizomes under the ground. Um, it, it, it just anywhere it gets established, then it, it really just, just takes over um, the area. And the problem is that it can get spread by, by the rhizomes. Um, most of it in Georgia so far, we're not seeing that it's, um, it's being spread by seed. It's mostly being spread by rhizomes. But, you know, if you own different lands and you're setting up your food plots for hunting and you carry your your tractor from place to place and it doesn't get clean then you you end up you end up spreading it um, it is again a major fire hazard and a major smoke hazard um, we started working on this in in 2006 um, this is where we knew about it then there were 20 sites in 10 counties since then it has continued to to spread, um, and and in 2020, um, there's now 1,300 known sites in 65 counties. Um, but in a lot of ways, this is a success story, and it's a success story because the Forestry Commission, along with the U.S. Forest Service, is treating this anytime there's a found population, and so where the numbers jumped, the numbers jumped because of education, because anytime, um, you know, a forestry talk was done, forestry training was done, um, you know, we got the word out about this species um, through the Forestry Commission, through University uh, Extension, and, and we were able to get people to report it and, and, and tell us about it, and because of that, we were able to treat it and really decimate the population. Um, most of it, 74% of it, has been find, found in, in um, pine forest. And then you start looking at right of ways. Um, we are seeing less detections um, year to year. These were the ones in, in 2019. They do these maps annually. Um, you know, we had a few bad years. Um, it's been pretty consistent but but we're hoping that that we're at least on on a downward um slope on that um again only 214 of the 1300 known spots are active um many of them you know 100 of them are year one negative 107 or year two negative to become eradicated you've got to have three years of negative um at the uh at the location. Um, so again, this was done by training um, and, and partnership through different groups. You know, there's a lot they can do, um, whether it's fire related, whether it's soil chemistry related, um, whether it's just reducing biodiversity. You know, they impact recreation, they impact the natural areas, they can have impacts on agriculture and forestry. Um, and so 
what 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 my group has tried to do is beyond just educating about this we've tried to build some tools to help with it and so we built some websites invasive.org invasive plant atlas as well as ways to report invasive species a lot of what we've done is build these tools um, ed maps edd maps um, is a website that we've built that we that can be used to report invasive species um, and, and no you don't need to report the, the, the species that your neighbor planted in, in, um, in their yard. But, but reporting the stuff that is out there, this, this widespread, and, and I'm gonna go through it, I'm gonna finish with, with, um, with some, this Garden Smart Plant Wise suggestions. And, and that's really the fourth thing, you know, the final thing I wanna leave you with is what you can do. And so reporting it, Get involved. There's a Georgia Exotic Pest Plant Council um, that that has been ha holding annual meetings for I think 15 years now. Um, you know, volunteer with those groups. Um, look at other ways to to do to help protect the natural areas um, around you. Um, you know, you can do weed pools. You can do other things. Um, so invasive.org um, website. Asian John Hornet. That was another one of these. Um, ones that were, was found in, in Washington. No, we don't have them um, in Georgia, but that those few weeks where, um, you know, all the stories about murder hornets, we, we got a lot of phone calls about people who thought they had them. Um, the Invasive Plant Atlas, EdMaps website, um, as well as the Bugwood apps um, that you can use to get more information about these species and also report them. So, um, Finally, these plant-wise, um, this was something that was done, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, as well as the Garden Club of America with the Park Service and others put together. And it's some simple steps. First of all, know your plants. Know what's good, know what's bad. You know, use the native or the non-invasive alternatives. Um, fireweed is an example here for, instead of purple leaf strife. Um, watch out for the hitch hitchhikers, whether it's on equipment or boats or anywhere. You know, that, that's where cleaning, um, there's a campaign that is play, clean, go. And so, you know, with the, with the important thing in there is when you get through playing, make sure you clean. Um, when you share things, and, and we all know gardeners like to share their plants. So when you share things, you know, make sure that what you're sharing is not something that's going to be a problem. Um, try to use seed mixes that are invasive plant free. Um, some more and more starting to be labeled that way. Use weed free soil and mulch. Um, if you can find it, that's going to help prevent the problem. Um, if it's an aquatic plant that's going to live in your backyard pond, there's a good chance it could be a, 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 an invasive. Um, so just be careful about those, um, you know, water hyacinth definitely um, very pretty, looks good in your pond, but, but it can definitely be a problem if it got into your bigger pond. If you do have some of these plants in your yard, just watch out for sprouts, watch out for volunteers. Look for those, those um, volunteers that may be coming up and, 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 you know, pull them, get rid of them quickly. Um, and then if you, you know, if you've got a bigger yard and you've got something in your yard that, that um, is a problem, make sure you dispose of it and it doesn't end up getting spread um, um, when, when moved. Um, and, you know, I, I, I like this. If you can't part with it, remember, contain it, control it, or cage it. Um, you know, make sure that, that it doesn't, you know, tend to, you know, um, lead to the bigger problem. Um, so, as I mentioned, you, you know, look out for new infestations. Y'all are, you know, master gardeners are know what's around them. They know, um, they know their area. And so, um, you know, if you see something you've never seen before and it's spreading quick and causing a problem, whether it be a plant or, or an insect or, or something else, you know, make sure you get somebody's opinion on it. Call somebody, call your local county agent, get their input. Hey, what is this? 
you know, they'll probably send pictures to somebody and, and we'll figure out what it is. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very much, uh, if you see something, say something, because you may be the one that stopped. If anything, master gardeners are the first line of defense from the next invasive species. The, the ones that are found are, are usually found um, by that person that just cares and is, and is, um, and is, and is you know, doing their part. So we don't want, this is a native longleaf um, wiregrass ecosystem. We don't want our forest to look like this. We don't want our hardwood forest to be overtaken by species like privet. Um, we don't want kudzu to become the next boll weevil. So we need to do everything we can um, to control these plants um, and, and maybe someday, um, you know, I, I was part of a conference today and um, somebody said, what is, the, what is the wish for invasive species? And yes, it's really funding and making sure there's enough money to do the work that needs to be done. Um, but I said, wouldn't it be nice if, um, you know, in a presidential debate, there was a question about invasive species, you know, where it, it hit that level that, that climate change has, has in terms of environmental importance that is something we're, we're gonna talk about. So, um, and be careful because you never know where the next one um, is going to be hiding. So with that, uh, um, I will be glad to take any questions. Questions also welcome at your local extension office. Thank you for watching.